All right, the long-awaited solution video for lab eight. I'm a little behind, but let's go for it. We went through most of this in lecture two weeks ago, or however long that was. Um, so let's go through this again. Question number one, we've got a two by two design and we're making some assumptions. The dependent variables coming from a normal distribution, mean zero, standard deviation one, we assume the main effect of A causes a shift of 0.5 standard deviations. Um, and then for level one of B, we're assuming it's a kind of control where we would measure the standard effect of A. And that level two of B is an experimental factor intended to reduce the effect of A by 0.25 standard deviations, which is a kind of interaction. Now what I had done in our solution that we discussed in class was just copied the code uh, from, the, from the lab. Let's see if I can just point to it quickly. So if you were to go to lab eight and take a look at this first code block plus this little piece here that makes the graph, you could copy all of that as I did. And if I just press play here, oops, uh, looks like I need to define Sybil as a library. And also ggplot with this code. And, oh, uh, right. <laughs> the last piece there was we are using patchwork to display multiple graphs at the same time. Okay. So this plot would, uh, should illustrate the f features of interest. Um, we have independent variable A in these two levels here. Uh, there's a average difference we're going to have to go up to here of uh, have we programmed that correctly let's see okay yeah i mean there's a couple ways of interpreting this but here we have in level one of b we've got the effect of a going from zero to 0.5 standard deviations and in level two of B, we've got the effect of A going from zero to 0.25 standard deviations. And there's the line graph of that. So that's what we were asked to program, make a graph for, and we did it using all of the code that we discussed in lecture. I'm gonna do one more solution here, I'll call this the alternative solution. And this is just a um, much shorter way. Uh, we don't have to get very complicated here. We could simply create data directly that would satisfy these conditions. So we could use a tibble and we could define IV1. We're going to have to define IV2 and our dependent variable, which would be the four means so just thinking about what we want to code in here, we've got two levels of IV1. Let's call them one and one and two and two. Remember this is going to be crossed with IV2. So here we have one and two and one and two. Well, I guess I'm calling this uh, A and B. So how about we change that to A and B to be clear. And finally, we have some means that we want to supply, and we only need four to make this graph. And the idea is in um, level one of B, the effect of A has, uh, so let's, oh, sorry, I'm just gonna put four zeros here representing the four means, and we just need to think about programming them. So if we're thinking about um, 
the main effect of A, it's something like this. We're saying that, let me go back up here, there's a main effect of A causing a total shift of 0.5 standard deviations of the means of the mean between the levels. So we have that uh, right here. Just for fun, I'm going to take this line graph code. And I think we should be able to just do that. So model data, line graph code, here we go. So we've programmed in an effect for the levels of A, one versus two, that effect is 0.5 difference. And it's the same for both levels of the B factor. You, the lines are right on top of each other. You can't see the two different lines. The question states that level one of B is a control where you expect to measure the standard effect of A. I assume that level two reduces the effect of A by 0.25 standard deviations. Okay, so this first value um, might be easier just to quickly look at this table. So this first value here is zero is um, in level one of B and level one of A. This value here is also in level one of B, so this would be the control condition, but it's level two of A. So we'd expect in level one of B to measure zero and a 0.5 here. For these two values, we're expecting um, the difference between level one and two for A will be reduced by 0.25. So we're thinking this will be a 0.25 instead of a five. So when we're in level two of B, the difference between one and two is reduced by 0.25. So that would be this value. And, and there we have it. There's it's sort of up to you how you want to code it. So for example, here's another solution that will produce the same answer. We'd, we could list the levels of A and B differently and achieve the same result. I'm going to set these to zero. And let's say we wanted to code it like this. So now in independent variable A, it's going one, two, one, two, and in independent variable B, we're going one, one, and two, two. So this is the same design. And if we were to look at this table, it's a little bit easier to talk about the big idea here because things are lined up in a nice way. So we're thinking that in level one of B, the difference between one and two in A, so these two values, will be 0 and 0.5. That's the normal difference we're expecting, so we put the 0.5 here. Now in level 2 of B, the difference between 1 and 2 in A is going to be reduced. It would normally be a 0 and a 0.5, but it's now being reduced by 0.25, so we put 0 and 0.25 here. So the organization is slightly different depending on how you choose to list the levels of the factors. But as you can see, it produces the same graph. All right, moving on. Conduct a simulation-based power analysis analysis <laughs> to answer the questions. All right, how many subjects are needed to detect the main effect of A with power equals 0.8? Now again, if you go to lab eight, there's a simulated power analysis section. Uh, what we did in class was just copy this code out, which is set up to do these kinds of analyses and um, brought it over here. 
So how many subjects are needed? Um, let's take a look at this. So we've got um, an N we can assign per group. Remember this is between subjects. We've got our independent variable A and B. Um, we're saying, let's just, let's just run this a bit just to see what we're doing with this code. Um, all right, we have it with this organization here where we're doing level A, one, one, level, and then two, two, and then for B, it's going one, two, one, two. All right, so this versus this is going to be the zero versus 0.5, that's uh, level one versus two of A in level one of B. And here is zero versus 0.25, that's in level two of B, the effect of A is reduced by 0.25. So what we're gonna do is um, effectively create a little data frame where if we were just to do this one little piece, I think we have to go here just like this. So this is a way of randomly sampling values for four subjects where um, this value is being sampled from the, this distribution this value is being sampled from this distribution, this value is being sampled from this one, and this one's being sampled from this one. Now, that's only giving us four subjects, one in each of the four different conditions. So here, if we use embed this in a replicate function and um, replicate this whole activity as many times as we have up here, so if we did this, set it to two, when we run this piece, we are going to get data for eight subjects. And the organization is A1, B1, A1, B2, A2, B1, A2, B2, and then it, then it starts repeating. All right. So these things are all combined together to produce a simulated data frame like this. So this, this is an example with eight total subjects, two people per uh, cell, with simulated data corresponding to the example problem. And then we can run the ANOVA, we can grab the p-values for each of the uh, the main effects and the interactions. And this is asking how many subjects are needed to detect the main effect of A with PowerPoint 8. So we are interested in running this simulation, let's say a thousand times. How long does that take? Not too long. And then we can report this proportion of p-values for uh, the main effect of A that were significant. So with n equals two per condition, we're getting 0 0.07 uh, significant experiments, which is not very many. How many subjects do you need for power equals 0.8? Well, we could fiddle around with this. Let's put 40 and run this whole thing. And we got 63% uh, of the experiments. Let's go up to 60. So I'm just kind of ballparking this, not getting an exact value of number of subjects. So it's probably around 60. I would accept this as an answer. Um, I would accept, you know, 57 probably as an answer. Let's see what we get with 57. 
Okay, maybe it's 57.79 is pretty close. Um, let's do an, an alternative answer here just to show you one more little detail and to make this whole piece of code just a little bit shorter in terms of its style. I'm going to make a new code chunk here. Sometimes it's nice to have uh, your code nice and tidy. So in this specific example, we're only interested in the main effect of A, so we don't need those other things. We don't need these things for the main effect of B and the main effect, or the, sorry, the interaction effect. And let's, so what I wanted to do was illustrate another way of defining or the, the dependent variable here. And the strategy I adopted in this case was to sample uh, one value from the R norm function and do that four different times for each of the four different conditions that have different means. Okay, so let's just do a little bit of playing around right here with the R norm function. So this would sample one value from a normal distribution with a mean of zero and standard deviation of one every time. Now, it's interesting, we can supply a vector of values here, inside here, where, the, where we're defining the mean. For example, let's see what happens if we go like this, zero, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. All right, so we're now sampling still one value. Um, let's modify this uh, slightly. I have one, two, three, four, five, six different means here. So if I put a six here, watch what happens. So we're now sampling a value um, randomly from six different normal distributions where the mean is different. The first value gets sampled from a normal distribution where the mean is zero. The second value gets sampled from a normal distribution where the mean is 10. And the third value gets sampled from a normal distribution where the mean is 20 and so on. So, can we use this style to replace this style. What we want to have is four means, one, two, point five, point two five. So this is the same order as before. Now if we did this, put a four here, um, we should get four different values. Uh, sorry, and each of these values will be sampled from a different normal distribution. If we made the standard deviation very small, we should see uh, that the mean should be very, sorry, the sample values should be very close to these means. So let's see if that's true. So the first one is point, these first two are very close to zero, and this one's close to 0.5, and this one's close to 0.25, so that is happening. What happens if we put an eight here? All right, I make it a little easier to, to read. So the first value is zero, second value is zero, third one's 0 0.5, then next one's 0 0.25, then we have zero, zero, 0 0.5, 0 0.25. So it repeats the sequence, which is what we were doing up here using the replicate function. So if we did four times n, uh, we would accomplish the same goal as we did with this, just like that. All right. <clears throat> if we wanted to be a little bit more compressed, we could 
you put all of these three uh, aspects of the data frame just directly into the data frame as we define it. So we could define these in a tibble if we wanted. I'm not sure this necessarily saves a line. But okay. Um, if we really wanted to compress this even more. I think we should, let's just try this. We've got our SIMDF, we've got our ANOVA results. And if we wanted to add this onto the end of this ANOVA results, I believe, oh, does it, I guess that doesn't work. Interesting. So my goal here was to just shorten our code. This is not going to run any faster or slower. Um, and I wanted to introduce you to the idea that you could supply a vector here in the means for the R norm function. This can be useful. We'll use that for lab nine. But if we do this, we should get a similar outcome as before. Oh, but we didn't, we got a power of one. Well. I forgot to change the standard deviation back to one. And if we put it back to one, we're getting a power of 0.8, sim similar to what we got up here. Okay, let's move on to this third question. How many subjects are needed to detect the interaction effect with power equals 0.8? Uh, let's just take this cleaner code that we wrote and pop it in here. Actually, because we have a few different things we want to keep. Well, whatever. I'm going to delete all this stuff and change the name here to a, b, p value representing the interaction. All of this doesn't have to change but we want to record the interaction, which is the third value in the summary. So just as an example, when we get our AOB results, remember this is a, if we print it out, it's gonna give us the ANOVA table. We're interested in this p-value right here. And if we inspect this object, Um, sorry, it's a list, so we go into the list and press dollar sign. Then we can see the p-values, and we want the third one here, so that's why we use square brackets three. All right. So we're going to save a thousand different p-values, and we're going to see how many were less than 0.05 for a thousand replicated experiments. And we've, we're gonna use the same values we found for the main effect of A, 57 subjects per condition. So in this case, the power is only 0.18. To detect the, the particular interaction we programmed in here, we're gonna need more subjects. So how many more? What about 200 subjects per condition? So we're going to need more than that. Um, how about 400? It's sort of rough, roughly the case that if you double your n, you, you know, almost roughly double your power. So that didn't quite happen here. We got 70% power now. What if we go to 500 subjects per condition? So this is four conditions. That'd be a thousand, or sorry, 2,000 people you'd need. Looks like 500 is about right for your 80% power here. So that's a lot of people. 
if your effect was that particular size. You're going to need a bunch of people to find it. Anyway, so this is a, one of the reasons why I think doing simulated power analysis is interesting because you can go in here, put some means you would expect to find and make your assumptions and, and see what you would expect to happen in, in these kinds of experiments before you run them. All right, that's it. There was a bonus point question here. I'm going to copy this in. The bonus point question is create a power curve showing how power for the interaction effect in this example is influenced by the number of subjects. All right, and we're going to say choose a range of n from 25 to 800. And then run the power analysis for increments of 25 subjects and plot the results using ggplot. All right, let's do that. We have some working code here for the interaction power analysis. And we pretty much want to repeat this whole thing several times over for, um, what did it say? A range of n from 25 to 800 in increments of 25 subjects. I'll make a little variable called subject increments. And we could use the seek function here. We could go from 25 to 800 in steps of 25. And what does that give us? 2550. Yeah, there we go. So basically, what the question is asking is set n to 25 and do this whole thing, figure out the power when n is 25. Then set n to 50. And do the whole thing again and find power when n is 50. And then do all of that for all of these things here. Get all the different power estimates and put them in a plot. I'm going to make a little variable called power estimate. And this is where I'm going to save my uh, estimates of power. Um, all right, I'm kind of jumping around a little bit. I made um, a place where I can save the power estimate that I compute at the end of a simulation. And I put it into the power estimate variable that I'm going to make up here. And I'm saying, put it in at index SI. Now I haven't um, made SI yet. I'm going to do that in a loop. So first of all, let's make a loop for, now there's a couple ways to do this, but I'm going to do it like this, SI, uh, and I'm just making up this as a name for an index, in one to the length of subject increments. Now, formally, this is a vector. There are 32 elements in subject increments, and so the 1 to length of that just counts from 1 to 32. That means for each step of the loop, and I'm starting here, and I'm going all the way down and wrapping it just like this. So to make it easy to see that all of these things are inside the loop, I highlight them and then press tab so that they're indented. So for each step of the loop, SI will be 1, then 2, then 3, and then 4, and then so on. That means the power estimates will be added to the next slot in the power estimate object. However, um, what I want to happen after each iteration of the loop is to change 
the number of subjects. And so we want to change n as a um, we'll go across the values in subject it's increments. Start at 25, go to 50, go to 75, go to 100. So we could put SI here, just like this. So for example, when SI is 1, which is what it will be in the first step of the loop, subject increments will be 25. And when it's a 2, it'll be 50, and so on. Now, I'm going to run the loop, the inner loop here. Oh, sorry, this is the inner loop. Only 10 times, just to do this really fast, just to see if it's going to work. This will not be very good power estimates because I didn't run the simulations enough times, but I wanted to find out if the variable I made called power estimate contains the information I'm looking for. Okay. Yep. I'm just going to quickly make a ggplot for this. Um, and I realized before I do that, I'm going to have to make a data frame. So I'm going to make the data frame as a tibble. And I just want two things in here. The first thing I want to have in here is the number of subjects. So I've got a variable for that already. It's called subject increments. And then I want to have the power estimate associated with each subject increment. So it's going to look like this. I could use this in a ggplot to plot the power curve. Excuse my typos along the x-axis, we will have our different subject increments. And along the y-axis, we will have our power estimate. We can look at points along the way. We can connect them with a line. And it'll look something like this. OK, so the power estimates are way off. Let's bump this up to a thousand. And I'm going to press play. Now, this will take a little bit longer. I mean, we are doing now 32,000 total simulations. And I'm just going to pause this and come back when, it, uh, when it's over. All right, here we have our power curve. And this would be fine if you wanted to make it easier to interpret. So we've got um, an x-axis. The units of the x-axis are in 200s. It's kind of hard to figure out what each of these dots are. So if you wanted to change the x-axis, there's something called scale underscore x. And we have a continuous variable here. So we're going to check continuous. There's an option called breaks. Whatever you put in here will be the, the, the ticks that we will see on the bottom. Now, if you wanted to go and look at uh, all the subject increments, we, that variable, remember, has 25, 50, uh, 75, 100, and so on. So we could write it like this. One issue here is the numbers are now overlapping with each other. So that's kind of a problem. You could try to fix that using theme classic and the base size parameter. I've used this all the time. Maybe make that a little smaller. This is just one of these situations where if you have fonts like this size, even if you make them really small, the numbers will overlap. Uh, there's a way to make the fonts or the yeah the printout here go horizontal or rotate a little bit. My preference might be to I don't know, keep the font size a little easier to read, but instead of going 
for every tick, maybe do every other one. So for example, we could write our own little sequence, go from 25 to 800 in steps of 50. So that also makes it pretty easy to read. You could do the same thing for the y-axis here. As you can see, it's in steps of 0.25. So it's kind of hard to see like, okay, well, where's 0.8 exactly? If we wanted to modify this, we can go find our scale y continuous. And let's say we want to go from 0 to 1 in steps of 0.1. That makes it a little easier to read. If you wanted to draw a line over from 0.8, there's something called geom h line. And it has a y intercept parameter. And you could say 0.8. And then it's going to draw that right over. And so we're kind of looking around here. And it's around 500, looks like. All right, so there's an example of answering the bonus question. So that's it for the Lab 8 Solutions.